We're in Hebrews chapter 11 tonight, <clears throat> and we're talking about Moses in our last lesson, actually, I guess, about his parents, but then also about Moses and his faith, and we're going to focus in on him <clears throat> for our study tonight and the things that are mentioned here in Hebrews 11, and which will kind of take us then into the children of Israel uh, entering the land of Canaan, uh, and we'll see how far we get into, uh, into that part of the story. But let's pick up, we, we left off, we'll go ahead and read verse uh, 22, talking about Joseph, and then we'll get down to Moses. Verse 22 says, By faith Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel, and gave commandment concerning his bones. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents, because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith Moses... <clears throat> when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect under the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible." Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of, uh, of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. And then verse 29 says, By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, are saying to do, were drowned. So we read this passage and we get kind of a broad spectrum uh, of time with the history of the children of Israel from their going down into Egypt at the time of Joseph, when Jacob and the rest of the brothers or Jacob's sons came down into Egypt, through the years of captivity to finally their escaping Egyptian bondage and starting on that uh, journey to the promised land. And so a lot of things happened, obviously, in that time in, in history, but the highlights that are given here in Hebrews 11 are meant to demonstrate and to give us an example of faith and how faith was involved. So from Joseph believing and trusting in God that he was going to keep his promise to deliver his people from Egypt, and so he gave instruction about carrying his bones, which we talked about in our last lesson, how, how they did that and carried those throughout the wilderness. But the, the promise was that they weren't going to remain in Egypt. God would deliver them. And then we skip you know, over the, the time in Egypt to the time of Moses. And Moses' parents had that same kind of faith in God. When he was born, Moses was, they hid him three months. So the Egyptians were trying to kill the Hebrew children so that they uh, wouldn't continue to grow and be so numerous and become a threat. But they disobeyed the commandment of the king in order to spare Moses' life. And they also, it seems, were looking forward to the deliverance. Then we come to Moses himself in verse 24, and we're told that when he came to years, when he was mature, that he acted as a mature adult, and he made adult decisions and choices <clears throat> in his life. And in doing that, he, he made those decisions based on faith and not on sight. And I want you to notice the things that, that Moses did here, the choices that he made, and understand from the physical, the human standpoint, there wasn't really any logical reason to do this. So first of all, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So he rejected his Egyptian uh, heritage. And again, with just human eyes, that doesn't make sense. Why would you give up all of the prestige and all of the wealth, the riches of Egypt and their power and position and all of those things, why would anyone in their right mind relinquish that? But Moses did. Secondly, verse 25 says, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. So the second choice that he made was to willingly subject himself to affliction. He knew that if he chose to associate himself with the Israelites, that he was putting him in a place to be persecuted and to suffer from that physically as well as you know, emotionally and all the other things that he would endure. Why would anybody choose 
that instead of, again, the riches and, and all the things that went along with being a, an Egyptian. The end of that verse says, than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So the third choice was to reject sinful pleasures, which again doesn't make sense from a purely human perspective. If we just look at the world through man's eyes, you know, the wisdom of the world is, uh, you know, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Might as well live it up now because we're not going to be here long, so just indulge in whatever you like or whatever you want or whatever feels good. But Moses chose to reject those things. And again, just looking with human eyes, that doesn't make sense. And then verse 26 says, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. And so when you look at what he was choosing and what he was rejecting, he saw the uh, reproach that he was going to suffer as being more valuable than all that Egypt had to offer. And again, that doesn't make sense when you look with human eyes. What did the nation of Israel, the Israelites, they weren't a nation yet, but they were becoming one, what did they have to offer Moses? Egypt would give him money and power and position and authority and luxury and relaxation and everything that he could want from a human perspective. The Israelites had nothing to offer him physically, but bondage, slavery, and, and suffering. Yet he saw there was more value in that than there was with Egypt. And the point in all of those and looking at those choices that he made is that Moses and again, significantly, he was come to years till he had matured, not just physically, but also spiritually. He made his decisions with the eye of faith. The end of verse 26 says that he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. So Moses wasn't just looking at the material, but he was thinking beyond the here and now, beyond the physical, to the things that are of true value in this life. And those are spiritual things. And so he chose to associate himself with the people of God and to suffer whatever came because of that because there was a greater reward both here and now in this life. Spiritually, there was a greater reward than whatever Egypt might offer him. And in eternity, of course, the reward is far beyond reckoning it's the choice between heaven or hell and so Moses is pictured for us as being mature in his thinking because he looked at things with the eye of faith and he made the decisions that would uh, affect and govern his life you know from this moment forward everything that happens is because of those decisions and he made those decisions with complete trust in God and that's a key thing of course in Hebrews 11 that all of these heroes of faith, they all looked beyond this life to the next. And they knew that our reward is not here on, on this planet, but it's in the next realm, in the spiritual realm and in heaven. And so whatever must be endured here and now is worth the sacrifice in order to receive that eternal reward, which of course is salvation in heaven. So Moses was looking at things properly from God's perspective rather than from man's. So if you look at those decisions from purely a human perspective, it doesn't make sense. But when you add faith to the equation, everything makes perfect sense. And that's what these Hebrew Christians needed to be reminded of, that from a physical standpoint, it doesn't make sense to remain a Christian and to be ostracized and to be ridiculed and to be persecuted when, if you just go back to the law of Moses, all your family is going to accept you, your neighbors and your friends will accept you, everything will be fine, your life will be so much easier. If our basis of judgment is just human things, then that's obviously the right choice. But there's more than just the human perspective. There's the eye of faith. And so they needed to be reminded that the reward is not here and now, but it's through faithfulness here and now we receive the reward in eternity. And so Moses' faith is, uh, of course, a great example of that. So notice also in this passage that we're told that uh, he chose to suffer affliction 
with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And when we read that verse, and we often hear it used and, and preached in sermons, and we talk about it in lessons, um, as reminding us that there is pleasure in sin, but it's only for a season. It's only temporary. And that's true, and that principle is true. But we also need to understand that when uh, the writer of Hebrews is talking about a season, the season here for Moses was the rest of his life. That if he chose to remain an Egyptian, he would live that lifestyle you know, until he died. And so the pleasure of sin for a season meant the season of his life, that he might live in luxury and with all of the material pleasures that come along with that sinful decision until he died. But once he died, then he would receive you know, the reward. And I just mention that because sometimes we say sin has pleasure for a season, and then we look at people and they just keep on living in sin, and it seems like nothing ever goes wrong in their lives. Well, that may be part of it also, that it doesn't happen in this life, but it will in the next, and that, that's the warning. But there's always a limit to the pleasures of sin. It's always going to end, whether in this life or when we die or the Lord returns and we go into eternity. Sin cannot give that pleasure permanently because it's not permanent. The only thing that is is the spirit and the true blessings that come from, uh, that come from God. So he looked at his life and realized what he could have for the season of his life, and he chose to be with God's people rather to enjoy all of the pleasures that came with remaining an Egyptian. And I think we need to understand that also when we talk about the pleasures of sin for a season, we usually think of you know, doing something sinful, a lust of the flesh or something. And you say, well, that sinful activity has pleasure with it. But, but Moses wasn't choosing to do sinful things necessarily. He was just choosing to be on the wrong side, to be on the side of Egypt rather than the side of God. And so whether or not he committed you know, acts of the flesh that contained pleasure or whatever, um, that wasn't the point. The pleasure of sin was that if he remained with the Egyptians, you know, he had the, the luxuries and, and all those things we've talked about. And so it's not necessarily just sinful lusts or desires, but any time we choose the wrong side, man's side instead of God's, then we've sinned. And there may be you know, benefits that come from that, physically speaking, but it's not going to last. It can't carry us into eternity. And so, again, Moses uh, demonstrates that. Then in verse 27, it says, or verse 26, rather, it says that uh, he was esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. And the reproach of Christ there doesn't mean um, that he understood about Jesus, you know, or being a Christian or anything like that, but it means that the reproach that Christ suffered while he was on the earth is the same that Moses suffered when he chose to align himself with God's people rather than Egypt. And so he willingly made the choice to go with the Israelites, and that in turn caused him to be reproached, just like Jesus was reproached. So you think about Jesus having to deal with uh, the Pharisees, for example. They're the people of God, supposed to be. And, and of all people who should have recognized him as the Messiah and listened to what he said and followed him, it should have been them. They spent their lives studying the law of Moses, yet they were his greatest enemies. And you think about Moses when he's leading the children of Israel out of uh, Egypt to the Promised Land, who were his greatest enemies? It wasn't the, the Amalekites or the Edomites, though they had struggles with them, the greatest enemies were the children of Israel, the people who literally saw the ten plagues, crossed the Red Sea on dry ground, heard God's voice from Mount Sinai. They were the ones who tormented Moses, constantly wanting to stone him and to put him to death and to depose him from his place and let someone else be their leader and go back to Egypt and complaining about this and complaining about that. His struggle was with them more than any outside enemy. And that's the same kind of reproach that Jesus faced. And so there are, are parallels, obviously, to be seen there in the leadership of Moses and of Christ 
and of course what, what they suffered. But that's kind of the idea of talking about the reproach of Christ, that the things that Jesus went through, Moses had also gone through. Of course, they didn't ultimately kill Moses. It doesn't mean that everything was the same, but it's the principle that if you choose to do right and to follow God, you will be reproached. You'll have enemies who will try to undermine you and to you know, destroy your name and, and all of those things. And that's really what's being said here that is a fundamental principle that the Hebrew Christians needed to remember that if you choose Christ, if you choose to be with God and with his people, it's guaranteed you will have enemies and you will be reproached and ridiculed and, and all of those things. It's why Jesus teaches us to count the cost before we become a disciple, before we obey the gospel, because you will have enemies. And Moses knew when he made that choice that he was making enemies, but he did it with the eye of faith and he understood the reward, so he chose the right thing and then endured whatever he had to face. Well, these Christians should have and were supposed to have understood when they became Christians that they were making enemies. There would be people who didn't like them and who opposed them, especially their Jewish family and community. And so now that you've made that commitment to Christ, you can't say, well, I have enemies and so I'm going to go back to the old way. I mean, you can. That's what they were doing. But you can't do that and be right with God. And the writer of Hebrews is saying it's always been this way. It was this way with Noah, it was this way with Moses, it was this way with Jesus, it's this way with you as Christians, and it will be until the end of time. And so the lesson is, again, Moses' faith was to look beyond the persecution and reproach and suffering of this life to the reward that is awaiting us. And so Moses, in that way, kind of becomes a, a parallel or a type of Christ. And I wanted to read a couple of things from back when we studied types and shadows uh, that relate to Moses and Jesus, how they compare to one another, just briefly to notice a couple of these, and then we'll finish this section in uh, Hebrews 11. But we learn from the story of Moses and from Jesus, of course, that they both, when they were infants, were saved from, uh, from death, as it were. Moses, of course, when his parents hid him, as verse 23 talks about, um, Jesus in Matthew 2, his parents took him to Egypt to uh, flee from, from Pharaoh. Secondly, both were prepared for the work that God had for them uh, to do. So Moses' preparation was in the fact that uh, he was brought up as an Egyptian, so he understood the Egyptian hierarchy and their leadership and how they thought and how the government worked and all of those things. And so he was prepared to be able to overcome them and to lead the children of Israel out. And of course, he was also prepared by going into Midian for 40 years and being a shepherd and, and all of those things. Well, Jesus was prepared for his work. He was both God and man. So just like Moses was both an Israelite and an Egyptian, Jesus is both God and man, and he's able to be the mediator, the one to, uh, to bring God's people out from, uh, from the world. They both made uh, great sacrifices to save others. Moses, of course, um, forsook the riches of Egypt, as we were just talking about. Jesus left the riches of heaven to come to this world to die for our sins. Moses, later on, of course, was sent by God to save Israel. And Jesus was sent by the Father to save the world. And so both of those things required giving up great things and wonderful things in order to to do that but they both did both of these uh, individuals had spokesmen to deliver their message so we know later in the story that one of Moses excuses was that he wasn't a good speaker so God chose Aaron to speak for him well Jesus had his apostles and of course Jesus preached while he was on the earth but he wasn't going to be here forever and so when he ascended, he gave that authority to the apostles, who then would be his spokesman and to speak um, in his name. There are a lot of other similarities in the lives of Moses and Jesus. They both fasted for 40 days, Exodus 34, 28, it's Moses, and of course Jesus in Matthew 4. They both exercised power over the sea, 
Moses parting the Red Sea, Jesus calmed the storm, walked on water, those things. They both fed a multitude, Moses with manna, Jesus with the miraculous feeding of the 5,000 and the 3,000. They both had radiant faces. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. His face was shining, and he wore a veil. Jesus, of course, in the transfiguration, his face um, also shined. They both had to put up with murmuring and complaining of those who shouldn't have been doing that. Obviously, the children of Israel and then Jesus with the, the Pharisees and the crowds and sometimes his, even his own disciples. They both were uh, discredited at home, if you will, when Moses was ready to lead the people and he killed that uh, Egyptian who was persecuting an Israelite. Uh, he had to flee and to run away. And not just because, you know, the Egyptian said you shouldn't have done that, but the Israelites said, who, who are you? to do this and so he had to uh, had to flee Jesus also of course was discredited in quotes you know at home by um, he said a prophet is not without honor save in his own country so as the people of Nazareth would say is not this the carpenter's son and we know his family and he can't be the Messiah and those kinds of things so the discrediting wasn't you know valid but it's what people tried to do uh, they both had 70 helpers Jesus sent out the 70 disciples Moses chose 70 to serve as judges under him. They both spoke as the oracles of God. Moses spoke by inspiration and delivered God's law to the people. Of course, Jesus did the same. They both established memorials, Exodus 12, with Moses, and there were several memorials throughout the journey. And Jesus' memorial, of course, is the Lord's Supper that continues to this day. They both uh, reappeared after their deaths. Moses at the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus, of course, at his resurrection up to his ascension. They both proved their claims by miracles. Moses said, let my people go. Pharaoh said, who is Jehovah that I should listen to him? And Moses said, I'll show you. And he proved it with the ten plagues. Jesus came claiming to be the son of God. They said, where's the evidence? And he proved it with the miracles. They both, of course, had to be believed and followed. Moses was chosen by God to lead Israel. And so if they wanted to escape bondage and they wanted to make it to the promised land, they had to believe, listen to Moses, believe him, and do what he said. And so they had to trust his word and follow his uh, guidance. And, of course, we have to do the same with Jesus. They had to make the choice to turn from Pharaoh to follow Moses. We have to make the choice to turn from sin, to turn from the devil, to follow Jesus. By faith, Israel was baptized unto Moses, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 and 2. They were baptized in the cloud and in the sea, under the cloud and in the sea. So walls of the Red Sea on either side, the cloud was on top, that's total immersion. But that was a baptism unto Moses, joining them to him for this journey to the promised land. Of course, Christians, to become a Christian, you are baptized into Christ and put on Christ. As Jesus commanded, Mark 16, 16, and as Paul tells us, Galatians 3, 27, Israel was not saved until they were baptized, until they made it through the Red Sea to the other side. That's when their enemy was destroyed. The walls of water came in on Pharaoh and his chariots. So until that time, they were still in danger of their enemy. But once they made it to the other side, their enemy was destroyed. And so their salvation was secured. We're not saved until we're baptized into Christ. Salvation is on the other side of the water. That's the principle of Romans 6, 3, and 4. We're baptized into his death. Like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Not before we're baptized, we have newness of life, but after we're baptized. And then the last thing about them is that they were both lawgivers. Obviously, Moses gave the law of Moses, and Jesus gives us the gospel, the law of Christ. And the writer of Hebrews has used that comparison, of course, earlier in the book to show that as great as Moses was, Jesus is greater 
and better and superior. And so now in talking about Moses and his faith, the faith that he demonstrated in his life, it's not only reminding them of why they should live by faith, but again, that Christ is greater than Moses. And so Moses was faithful without Jesus. He didn't have Christ as a savior. He didn't have the gospel. He had the old law and the instructions from God, and he remained faithful. Now they have something far greater. They have the son of God and his law of grace, which is the gospel and all the blessings that come from the New Testament. So if Moses was faithful, how much more should they be faithful? And of course, should we be faithful? So those are just some, some comparisons between Moses and Christ because he um, understood the reproach of Christ. He suffered the way that Jesus did. So we come to verse 27 of Hebrews 11, and it says, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. And so this is uh, no doubt talking about the first time that Moses uh, forsook Egypt when he murdered the Egyptian who was um, abusing an Israelite. So he turned his back on Egypt when he attacked an Egyptian and chose to side with the people of God. And he did that not fearing the wrath of the king. So when we read the Old Testament story, uh, Moses fled, of course, at this time and ended up in Midian because there was a threat to his life because he had killed someone, and so his life could be in danger. But the writer of Hebrews shows us that even though his life was threatened, Moses wasn't afraid. He wasn't running away because he was scared, but as it says there, he endured as seeing him who is invisible. To endure means to, to hold on and to not give up and to not let go. And so he wasn't able to deliver Israel at that time, but he held on and, and he waited. And when the time came, of course, he, uh, he came back and did that with some questions in his mind maybe and his excuses but of course eventually he did um, what God had said. I wanted to read real quick from Acts 7 Stephen's sermon that we mentioned last time. He says in verse uh, 23 when he when Moses was full 40 years old it came into his heart to visit his brethren the children of Israel and seeing one of them suffer wrong he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian for he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren, why do ye wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at this saying, and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons. And so the conflict came when Moses tried to settle an argument between two Israelites. And of course, they didn't want to listen to him for whatever reason, because of their argument and their fight. And so they brought up the fact that he had killed this Egyptian. And so it was known that Moses had, had done this, and because of that, he had to flee. But Moses wasn't afraid of the king when he did that. He was fleeing partly because he's the one who's going to deliver God's people. And so uh, he can't you know, be arrested and put to death. But it wasn't out of uh, fear. That wasn't his motivation. Because the verse says it was as seeing him who is invisible. He didn't maybe understand exactly what God's plan was. But he knew that God had a plan. And that plan involved him. And so he had tried to do it his way on his own, and obviously that wasn't the right way. And so now he's going to, to go away and let God do it his way. So he still has that eye of faith, seeing uh, God who can't be seen, but he's real uh, to Moses. And then the story jumps in Hebrews 11, verse 28. It says, Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Um, interestingly, in Stephen's sermon, at that same point, he jumps from Moses uh, going to Midian to the burning bush and his call you know, to come back to, uh, to uh, Egypt. 
and then gets to, uh, he kind of skips over the ten plagues in that part. But anyway, the writer of Hebrews points out this uh, event of the Passover. And I think there's a reason for it. Obviously, there's a reason for it, but a good reason. And uh, it's an interesting lesson uh, to learn from it. So the Passover and the meaning of the word Passover or the idea of Passover is that whatever you want to call this being that God sent to kill the firstborn in Israel, uh, sometimes we call him the death angel, uh, but here the writer of Hebrews just says, he that destroyed the firstborn. Um, but in order to get him to pass over your house and not come in and kill your firstborn child, you had to sprinkle blood. Obviously, we remember the story, you would dip the hyssop in the blood and you put it over the lintel, the top of the door, and on the two doorposts. Now, when you and I read about that and we think about that, we understand, obviously, that from, a, again, a human perspective, there's no connection between having blood on your door to keeping your child from dying. Those two things don't connect in, in any logical way. The only reason that worked is because God commanded it. And that's what faith is. It's taking God at his word, even if I don't fully understand why God wants it done that way, I trust God and I do what he says. And so it's important, I think, to remember that because when it comes to baptism for the remission of sins, you know, we can sit and reason and, and talk from human wisdom all day long and we'll never come up with a, a reason, a logical reason that water has anything to do with my sins being washed away. There's no power in that water. There's nothing that it can do physically to take, excuse me, take away sins that are spiritual. The only connection between the water of baptism and salvation is the fact that God commanded it. And if I trust God, if I have faith like Moses and the children of Israel did when, when the Passover came around, then I'll do what God says, even if there's no logical human reason for it. There's no connection between blood on your door and your child's life being spared, except that God said so. And there's no connection between sin being washed away in the water of baptism other than God said so. That's the only reason we do it. And those who argue that baptism uh, is not necessary for salvation or that if you claim that you have to be baptized in order to be saved, then you're, you're working to earn your salvation, they miss the point entirely. Because these children of Israel, when they went out and killed that lamb and they dipped that hyssop in that blood and they painted it on their door, they were doing what God commanded them to do in order for the life of their firstborn to be saved. But they didn't earn that salvation in the least. They didn't walk around saying, look how good I am that I can save my child from the death angel by putting blood on the door. You put blood on the door any other day of the year and it wouldn't do anything for the health of your child. The only reason it worked is because God said so. And they trusted God enough to do what he said. They didn't earn anything. What they received was a gift from God because they complied with his will. And it's the same way with baptism. We don't go into the waters of baptism saying, look how good I am that I can wash away my own sins by getting in this water. We know that that's not how it works. God takes away our sins by the blood of his son, but he does it when we trust him enough to do what he says, to obey his commandment. And that's why baptism is so significant, not because we've made it that way, but because God says so. And it's the very you know, most basic understanding of faith that God says it, that settles it. And sometimes people add, you know, God says it, I believe it, and that settles it. And I guess that's way, that way in our lives, that once God says it, I need to believe it, and so I'm going to do it no matter what. But it's settled at the moment that God says it. And it's up to me then to trust him enough to do what he says. 
And that's what they did at the Passover. That's what we do when we obey the gospel, when we obey any commandment of God, even if it doesn't make sense. Because God said it, it's right. And so I'm going to trust him and then do what he's told me to do. It worked for the children of Israel. It'll work for us in baptism and in all the other things that we do to obey God. And that's the key to faith for these Hebrew Christians. If they wanted to remain true to the Lord, they had to keep trusting him, taking him at his word and doing what he said, not give up and go back to an old system that, that couldn't save them. So Lord really next time we'll pick up there, verse 29, talk a little bit about the Red Sea, and then we'll get into the land of Canaan with the walls of Jericho and the story of Rahab. And then we'll be coming to the end of these uh, heroes of faith and try to finish up the chapter. But we'll stop here for now. Pick up there next time. <clears throat>
I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and am come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt. And then Stephen says this in verse 35. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. So Stephen says the Moses that they rejected by saying, who made you the ruler and the judge of us? That very same Moses is the one that God sent and God sent him to be a ruler and a judge. Remember that the word judge is the word for a deliverer. When God raised up judges, he was raising up saviors to save and to deliver Israel. Well, Moses was to be a ruler and a judge. So the answer to the question is, who made you the judge? The answer is God did. The first time, Moses got in front of God, and he was ready to show them that he's the one God has chosen before God was ready. And he wanted to do it in a way that, that God didn't want it done. And so he needed a time out for about 40 years. And so God sent him to be a shepherd for 40 years. And then when the time was right, he came back as a ruler and a judge. But the point that I wanted to make, which I think is also the point that Stephen is making here, is that even after those 40 years and even after Moses came back and even after he did all those miracles and even after the Red Sea parted and they crossed it on dry land, the Israelites still said, who made you the ruler and the judge. They didn't want to listen to Moses. Before, when he was trying to defend them and deliver them through violence, they didn't want that. And now when he's delivering them and defending them with the hand of God and the miracles of God, they don't want that. They didn't want a ruler or a judge at all. They wanted to be the ruler and the judge of their own lives. And that's why they complained every step of the way through the wilderness. That's why they constantly rebelled against Moses and constantly wanted to kill him and to throw him off. But more than that, it explains to us why the minute that Moses left and went on Mount Sinai, they made a new God. Because not only did they not want Moses to be their ruler and judge, they didn't want God to be their ruler and their judge. And the point that Stephen is making to the Pharisees and the Sadducees is, you're just like your fathers. You, you have the very same attitude. The Son of God has come into the world, and he has done miracle after miracle after miracle, and you've rejected him, and you've said, who do you think you are? And you've attributed his power to the devil, and, and now you've crucified him because you have the same kind of heart that your ancestors did. And to prove Stephen wrong, what did they do? They stopped their ears, they ran on him, and they killed him. They stoned him exactly what he said they would do because that's the kind of heart that they had and the lesson of course is for us the warning to the hebrews when the writer of hebrews is, is talking about this is that they were in danger of developing that same kind of heart that if they rejected jesus because times got tough and they were persecuted and they were reproached and ridiculed and they gave him up and went back to the law of moses that's the beginning of the development of this kind of heart that the Pharisees had and that the Israelites had back in Moses day and so it's a warning to us as Christians to always keep our hearts open to God's truth to keep our hearts soft not hardened to reject him but soft to allow his word to come in else we can fall into this same trap and the the warning to us the picture is that when we find ourselves complaining the way that the Israelites did when we find ourselves wanting to put away what God says in order to do what I want to do, or I don't like that preacher, or I don't like that sermon because it stepped on my toes or whatever, and, and we start trying to replace God and his word with our own God and our own word, then we're falling into this same way of thinking that the Israelites had. And the end result of that, of course, was they didn't make it to the promised land, and we won't make it to heaven with that kind of attitude. The children of, uh, of, of the disciples of Christ, rather, the Christians, the Hebrews, 
were being warned of that very thing. They were in danger of leaving their only hope of salvation and missing eternal life in heaven because they wanted to have it their way instead of the Lord's way. And we always have to be aware of that danger and protect and guard our hearts against becoming hardened to the truth. So I hope it will challenge us and remind us of the importance of always being open to God's word and having the kind of faith that Moses did, that whatever God says, that's what we'll do. We'll obey his will and we'll receive the promise and the salvation that, that he offers us. Maybe someone here tonight needs to do that to become a Christian by having true faith in God that we'll take him at his word and obey. Believing in him, we'll repent of our sins, confess Christ as Lord and Savior, and be baptized for the remission of sins. Or having done that and gone astray, hardened our hearts, turned against the truth, that we'll repent of our sins, confess our wrongs, ask God to forgive us. And he will, he'll restore us, and once again we can be on that way to an eternal home in heaven. If you need to do that tonight, we'll help you in any way that we can if you'll let it be known by coming forward as we stand and as we sing. While we pray.